Welcome and thank you for joining us at today's session, Nutrition Education, What's New for Reporting and Connecting with Clients. My name is Judy Simon and I'm the National Nutritionist with the Administration for Community Living, the Office of Nutrition and Health Promotion Programs. Many of you are familiar with the Office of Nutrition and Health Promotion Programs, but for those of you who aren't, our office manages health, prevention, and wellness programs for older adults. This includes providing behavioral health information, chronic disease self-management education programs, diabetes self-management, disease prevention and health promotion services, including Title IIId, falls prevention programs, and older Americans Act Nutrition Services, as well as oral health. I'm here today with my co-presenter, Carmen Clutter, Population Health and Nutrition Manager for the Ohio Department of Aging. Most of you are likely already familiar with ACL's Older Americans Act Performance System, or OAPS, which is the system ACL uses to monitor performance data and collect information on Older Americans Act Title III and Title VII programs and activities. You'll probably also heard that we have recently redesigned the State Performance Report, which is the form used to collect the data. We've done this to reduce reporting burden and streamline the overall reporting process for states, units on aging, and area agencies on aging. Starting October 1st of 2021, Title III nutrition programs began collecting their data using this new format. And there are some important changes you need to be aware of. So during this session, we'll talk about what nutrition education is, so during this session, we will talk about what nutrition education is and why it's especially important as people age. I'll review specific state program report and OAPS changes to the nutrition education definition and service unit descriptions. Carmen will share an in-depth explanation of what nutrition education is and how it relates to health literacy. We'll have a Q&A session where Carmen will share her expertise to help us understand the challenges and solutions for delivering nutrition education, what resources she recommends, and what plans the Ohio Department of Aging is doing to prepare for the changes in the SPR OAPS around nutrition education. And finally, we'll share some best practices from ACL Nutrition Innovations grantees. ACL awards these grants for innovative projects that enhance the quality, effectiveness, and outcomes of nutrition services programs provided through the National Aging Services Network. You'll definitely want to hear what these grantees have developed. Throughout our presentation, Carmen and I will be providing you with links to resources. And at the end of our talk, we also include our contact information in case you have questions about what we've discussed. So let's get started. As I mentioned earlier, the new state performance report is scheduled to be implemented in FY21, which began on October 1st, 2021. Before I begin, I want to start with mentioning that the Title III SPR data elements, while required to be collected, are not policies and procedures. Rather, they provide clarity regarding what is being counted with the new SPR OAPS to promote accurate data reporting. Your state may create additional requirements on top of the new SPR definitions or fewer service op unit options or other distinctive components. The Older Americans Act is a flexible law that allows state units on aging to meet the unique needs of their own older citizens. Section 305 of the Older Americans Act indicates that it is the responsibility of the state units on aging to administer the act and develop regulations, policies, procedures, guidance, and technical assistance to address program administration. It also places the responsibility for program policies, procedures, administration, guidance, technical assistance, and monitoring and evaluation at the state unit on aging level. So in summary, and important to remember, is that your state policies may not look exactly like the SPR OAPS. For example, I'll be listing examples of sessions of nutrition education in a few minutes. It's possible that your state will not allow for all those types of interventions to be counted. 
and that is their prerogative and is an appropriate step for a state unit on aging to take. When it comes to how nutrition education is reported in the new SPR OAPS, there are three areas I want to highlight. First, how nutrition education is defined. Second, what constitutes a service unit, also known as a session? And three, estimated audience size. So let's begin with how nutrition education is defined. Over the past year, ACL has begun the process of reviewing this definition, and we performed an extensive review of how nutrition education is defined by other federal agencies, as well as professional membership organizations such as the Society for Nutrition Education and Behavior and the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. It's interesting to know that each entity defines nutrition education a bit differently. ACL and the work group of experts and nutrition program stakeholders we brought together felt that it was important to revise the SPR nutrition education definition in order to establish consistency with organizations and federal agencies whose mission is to deliver nutrition education, as well as in consideration to minimize the burden of reporting. We also felt that highly disparate definitions could result with in confusion within the Aging Services Network. Now let's look at the new definition, which is an intervention. Now let's look at the new definition, which is an intervention targeting older American acts participants and caregiver. I'll go back. Now let's look at the new definition. It's an intervention targeting Older Americans Act participants and caregivers that uses information dissemination, instruction, or training with the intent to support food, nutrition, and physical activity choices and behaviors related to nutrition status in order to maintain or improve health and address nutrition-related conditions. Content is consistent with the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, is accurate, Set culturally sensitive, regionally appropriate, and considers personal preferences, and is overseen by a registered dietitian or individual of comparable expertise, as defined by the Older Americans Act. You'll notice that the definition begins with intervention. If you look intervention up in the dictionary, you'll generally find that it means an action taken to improve a situation. So the second change in the new state performance report involves service units, also known as sessions. We'll discuss now what constitutes a session. The new definition for nutrition education session relates to the fact that there is a new additional SPR OAPS element for nutrition education, which gathers the number of people attending a nutrition education session. We'll talk about that next. So nutrition education sessions may be delivered in person, via video, audio, online, or by hard copy. Questions have arisen about whether there should be a minimum time that should qualify for the appropriate delivery of nutrition education. There is an educational communications concept that uses interventions known as nudges, which are brief messages that overcome cognitive biases, thus allowing a brief communication to appropriately be considered as nutrition education. For more context, we've provided a few references. So let's go over some examples of service units. One presentation counts as one session, even if the presentation is offered multiple times by more than one presenter, including over more than one platform, for example, hard copy and online. One social media message is counted as one session, and that also includes text messages. For example, texts about the importance of calcium count as one session. And one newsletter counts as one session, even if the newsletter contains more than one article on nutrition. One set of hard copy materials, such as table tents, menu notes, and flyers, is counted as one session. For example, a flyer about the importance of calcium counts as one session. Each set of flyers, each covering a different topic, 
counts as separate sessions, respectively. Table tents that inform seniors about low sodium items on that month's menu count as one session, even if there are 10 tables, and each table has a tent on it. However, table tents on a different topic would count as a separate session. If the same message is used across more than one communications channel, for example, menu notes, along with social media, that's counted only as one session. As you recall, I began this presentation talking about state flexibilities that are built into the Older Americans Act. Now, that should not be confused with the flexibilities we often hear about as a result of the pandemic. So to be clear, the Older Americans Act indicates that it is the state's role to create policies, regulations, and technical assistance. States may also delegate some of the authority to AAAs. And we said your state or local policies may look a bit different because of this foundational framework. So let's think about how that might happen. Basically, a state or local policy may be more restrictive than the federal policy, but can't be more lenient. So even though our SPR allows for social media to be captured as a nutrition education session, a state's policy may not allow for counting social media or may allow for only certain types to be counted, similar with hard copy materials. Presentations may be allowed, but only if they're provided for a certain length of time, say for 10 minutes, and a state may require nutrition education to be provided for a number, a particular number of times per year. A state may also allow for nutrition educations to be presented only by certain types of professionals. What's not permitted is to, be go, is to go beyond the definitions and report those types of sessions into the SPR. There may be other reasons for gathering that data, such as state or local reporting. Also, remember, we only count individuals in the SPR who receive services funded in whole or in part with Older Americans Act funds. As mentioned, the third area we'll highlight is estimated audience size. This is a new element to be reported for nutrition education. You'll find this definition in the SPR OAPS Appendix A. According to Appendix A for non-registered services, which includes nutrition education and also information and assistance, an estimated audience size is to be reported. An unduplicated count of participants may not be feasible and therefore estimated audience size is acceptable. This figure is anticipated to be a duplicate count. Now your state may require unduplicated counts of nutrition education and therefore that is what would be reported in the SPR. We've done a little digging for, and for your information, when it comes to social media, it's possible to determine estimated audience and even to a certain extent, audience demographics. Here are some resources to help you to determine audience size from YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. To finish up my part of this presentation, let's go through a few examples. Let's say we have the same gut health workshop that is delivered across the state, which does occur occasionally to have statewide nutrition education programs, and it's implemented by five different providers. Each provider estimates the workshop was attended by 50 people. The session count is one because it is the same session provided, even though it was offered in different by different providers in different areas. An estimated audience size is 250, which is five providers at 50 attendees each. Now, if the program is not statewide, then an area agency on aging may utilize this exact same approach. Let's try again. A social media campaign on the importance of eating fruits and vegetables is received by 1,000 followers. The session count is one, and the estimated audience size is 1,000. Now I'll repeat here that your state may establish further criteria that may not allow for the same counting. A state would be within its authority to disallow social media from being captured if only um, or may require that only people who retweet are count, re 
or may the estimated audience size is 1000. Now I'll repeat here that your state may establish further criteria and may also not allow for the same counting. A state would be within its authority to disallow social media from being captured in the SPRO apps or may allow only people who retweet to be counted. So this is an example, not only of counting nutrition education, but also again about state flexibilities to develop policies, which are part of the framework of the Older Americans Act. So to summarize, key resources ACL has issued about changes to nutrition education, we recommend viewing the SPR OAP's Appendix A, which provides data element definitions, the FAQ document posted on OAPS that details how to track nutrition education units, as well as general technical documentation and training resources, which are available on the rep. which are available on the resources on this slide. I'll turn it over to Carmen to talk about nutrition education. Thank you, Judy, for that warm handoff. Next, I will focus on exploring the topic of nutrition education by reviewing the importance of health literacy and plain language guidelines when we develop appropriate content for our consumers. In Ohio, we define nutrition education as a service that promotes better health by providing consumers or their caregivers with accurate and culturally sensitive information and instruction on nutrition, physical activity, food safety, or disease prevention. We also require our education materials to be delivered to consumers that are tailored to meet their needs, their interests, and respect their abilities which also includes their current level of literacy. Nutrition education is any combination of educational strategies that are accompanied by environmental supports designed to facilitate voluntary adoption of food choices and other food and nutrition related behaviors that are conducive to health and well-being. Nutrition education can be delivered through multiple venues and includes activities at the individual, community, and our policy levels. To support these goals, nutrition education for our senior nutrition program participants must meet OAA nutrition program goals, be relevant and of interest to our audience, support adult learning needs, but also build off previous knowledge of our consumers, actively involve individuals in determining their personal goals and seek out opportunities to include hands-on activities for increased learning, focus on behavior modification, but also be achievable or able and easy for our consumers to implement. Seek opportunities to include contact with healthcare or nutrition professionals, aim to be presented in short sessions and finally, have an evaluation component that allows for both process and outcome measures to be tracked. Health literacy is the degree to which individuals have the capacity to obtain, to process, and to understand basic health information that they need to make appropriate health decisions. Results of the 2003 National Assessment of Adult Literacy show that only 12% of American adults have proficient health literacy skills. With that, nearly half of American adults lack even adequate literacy skills. Low health literacy is more prevalent among older adults, our minority populations, those who have low socioeconomic status, and people that are medically underserved. We know that health literacy challenge impact older adults even more than any other age group. On average, adults age 65 and older have lower health literacy than adults under the age of 65. Low health literacy among older adults is associated with increased reports of poor physical functioning, pain, limitation of their daily activities, and poor mental health status. 
Health literacy is a common thread through a lot of our programs, and a large portion of the people we serve are at risk. They need help understanding and navigating a very complex healthcare system. They require culturally competent providers who speak their language so that they can make informed healthcare choices. A number of our consumers may be confused with certain medical language and have difficulty understanding English. They may even struggle to fill out forms and many of them have access issues to healthcare providers in their community. But with proper training, healthcare professionals and nutrition professionals can identify consumer specific health literacy levels and make some simple communication adjustments to, under, to ensure that our consumers understand information that's presented to them. So reasons for an individual's low health literacy can be related to many factors. Sometimes healthcare professionals use words consumers just don't understand. They may also have low education skills or perhaps there's cultural barriers to their understanding. Some of these individuals have limited proficiency, English proficiency. So either they do not speak English as their primary language or they have a limited ability to read or write. Results from the National Assessment of Adult Literacy showed that Hispanic adults have the lowest average health literacy scores of all, of all of our racial and ethnic groups, followed then by Black and then by American Indian, Alaska Native adults. People with low health literacy and limited English proficiency are twice as likely as individuals without these barriers to report poor health status. Evidence supports that there's two major solutions to really improve our consumer comprehension, plain language and then teach back. So we'll be focusing on both of those today. Consumers with low health literacy may have difficulty filling out our enrollment forms or application forms. They're less likely to actually seek out preventative healthcare solutions and they may have difficulty understanding the connection between unhealthy behaviors and their overall health. Many also experience great challenges understanding information that's provided to them and identifying how to apply it to their own wellness. The good news is there's plenty we as healthcare professionals and service providers can do. So today I'm hopeful that the information I share with you um, will really benefit you and provide you with um, ideas and solutions to enhance the nutrition education you deliver to all of your consumers, regardless of their health literacy status. The best way to grab someone's attention is really to figure out who they are and what they want to know, right? Exactly. The same is true with nutrition education. When preparing nutrition education content, one of the best places to start is first determining who your audience is. Understand their demographics. This includes their age, their education, and their skills, including health literacy. Do not assume or guess what their needs are or who they are. It's very important to identify your audience so you can ensure that you're preparing nutrition education content um, that resounds well with them. Use language and examples that your audience knows and they're comfortable with. If needed, perhaps even identify cultural considerations to take into account or even some food preferences. If possible, identify the reading level of your consumers. If you do not know this or this is hard for you to identify, perhaps aim for a sixth grade to eighth grade reading level. First, start out thinking about their current situation. And then think about how you can guide them from their current knowledge to what you want them to know or what they should know. For example, if you are a congregate meal site and you really struggle with consumers' complaints of lack of salt shakers on the tables, first acknowledge that. You may know that this meal site tries to avoid that laurel of table, of table salt, but do your consumers really understand why? If we took the opportunity to educate them on you know, halting the salts and looking for opportunities to not increase sodium intake, would the lack of salt shakers on your tables be an issue? So to help you do this in your current practice, consider the following questions. Who is my audience? 
what does my audience already know about the given subject? What does my audience need to know? What questions will they have? And then finally, don't forget to acknowledge the outcomes. What are their desired outcomes? What are your desired outcomes? Is that an outcome to meet nutrition education standards? Is it solely to educate more people on the benefit of eating a reduced sodium diet? This is really individualized to both you and your consumers. In order to develop content that's unique for your users, you really need to define what they need. Listen to consumers' questions. What do consumers ask you when they're completing their annual verification or even their nutrition screenings? What do they want to know about your menu? What are your common consumer comments or questions or maybe even complaints? Talk to your consumers, consider what's of value to them. What do they want to learn? What would support them in maintaining their health and well-being? And consider surveying them. If you haven't done this before, this could be done directly at a congregate meal site or even a dropped off survey with a home delivered meal. Seek opportunity to directly ask your consumer what they want to learn and what they need to know. Once you uncover the need, you'll really be able to stand up and professionally and, professionally and properly educate on their concerns. Consider analyzing current data that may help you to sway decisions of education topics. Do your nutrition screening tools indicate that there's a risk of malnutrition or risk of food insecurity? Can you develop content to address those topic areas? Similarly, think to yourself, are you serving a population that experiences high rates of chronic disease? Perhaps once you think through some of those needs of your target audience, you'll be able to identify the appropriate nutrition content to focus on. <clears throat> the Plain Writing Act of 2010 was signed on October 13th of 2010, and this law requires federal agencies to really use clear communication that the general public can understand and they can use. While you may not be held accountable to this law and federal requirements, the guidelines do provide really valuable recommendations that you may find very beneficial to help enhance your current nutrition education practice. Plain language is a style of writing that's very clear and it's to the point. It helps to improve communication and understanding. And often it even takes less time to read and to understand. The Plain Language Association defines communication that is plain language when its wording, its structure, and the design are so clear that the intended audience, for example, our meal consumers, can easily find what they need, they understand the information they find, and they use that information appropriately. Writing in plain language is not unprofessional. It's not dumbing down the message or talking down to your audience. When you write clearly and you get to the point without using unnecessary words or technical jargon, you get your message across more quickly and you do increase the chance that the information you're presenting is understood and then used by your consumers. The overall goal of your consumer facing education should really touch three core components. They should be able to find what they need understand the information they find, and then finally, they use what they've read, what they've learned to meet their needs. Next, I want to actually explore a few um, guidelines and recommendations that you may want to use when you develop consumer-facing um, educational content. And there's many, many great resources out there. Um, I am partial to this resource that was developed by Maine Health. This resource is targeted for patient education in a clinical space. However, many of the tips and recommendations are absolutely applicable and valuable when preparing nutrition education content um, for our older adults. So when, even when you're preparing this content to be used in a community-based setting. So a lot of these concepts can also apply to in-person and virtual instruction as well. Um, so think to yourself if you're delivering um, virtual instruction, um, think, think through how you're delivering that, the message that you're providing, or if you're using any visuals, so flyers, posters, um, table tents, placemats, 
think, think through the messages that you're conveying in the spaces that you use to educate your consumers about nutrition. Another, another really um, great resource to share is the CDC Simply Put. It's a guide for creating easy to understand materials. This resource also speaks to many similar components um, of the previous resource I shared with you, but it also provides really good resources for checking uh, your current content and even reviewing the current content you have for readability. It also includes really practical examples of do this, not that, and offers really easy to follow recommendations to improve your current materials. I would encourage you to review this guide for easy, helpful tips to improve your current materials and offerings. Many times we have great materials that have been developed, but there's always an opportunity to perhaps even tweak some things to ensure that the message is appropriate. When beginning to develop your consumer education material, whether that's a handout, a brochure, or a poster, start first with your content. So by now, hopefully you've already identified the needs of your audience and figured out what they need to know. This need to know is going to be your content focus. Obviously, it goes without saying that you need to first guarantee your content is up to date and, and evidence based. For example, with your current content, have you reviewed the updated dietary guidelines for Americans to ensure your content you were using in years past aligns with the current DGAs? to ensure the best possibility of consumer understanding. You want to limit your content to a, ideally three to five major points. Um, and then you wanna also include some action focused ideas, what to do, what you need to know. Really try to frame your content positively in order to gain an audience response. And then always try to include a clear call to action if it's appropriate. So included here is an example of a nutrition education handout we developed for use with our home delivered meals. This was a specific example from a four part series we developed on food safety. For this particular handout, we focus on one main principle, cooking to proper temperature, and then we really limit it to four basic points. One, how to take a temperature, two, keeping food out of that danger zone, three, keeping food hot, and then four, microwave use. The call to action here is really emphasize, instructing consumers to use temperature, not color, to really assess the doneness of their food. The next concept to think through is your structure and your organization of your nutrition education resource. Content broken into small chunks with important points first, is kind of the way to go. These could include subtitles, um, headings, um, content that's really sequenced according to what the reader needs to know, and then key points are often and should be repeated as appropriate. Try to rely on short sentences. These are easier for consumers to understand. And even when you're educating about a complex topic, diabetes for example, Shorter sentences really work best because they can help break up that information into uh, smaller kind of bites and better that are better digestible for our readers. Organize information as the most important point, stand out first, and then repeat that information often. If your education piece includes paragraphs, make sure that each paragraph only covers one topic area. Paragraphs often look daunting to readers, particularly those individuals with low literacy levels. Um, so do your best to really try to limit paragraphs and um, really try to avoid long paragraphs. Long paragraphs often discourage our audience from even attempting to read the material or trying to understand. So if you have to use paragraphs, write very short paragraphs and then limit each paragraph to only one topic area. No matter what your education method, whether it's visuals, handouts, um, in-person or virtual instruction, your focus should really be on keeping the content as simple as possible. Vocabulary is really important part of communicating clearly. 
and the words and descriptions you choose make an impact on how well your audience will understand the content. In making word choices, pick familiar or frequently used words over unusual or obscure words. Use the simplest word that conveys your meaning. Remember, the goal with consumer education is to get your reader to understand it and apply it. So focus on making your content rich, but keeping your words clear and concise. Uh, Plainlanguage.gov is another great resource that has um, lists of words that are um, suggested to avoid um, jargon or um, suggested words in replacement of complex words. So I do recommend you check that out um, and look for opportunities to avoid jargon. Um, unless your, your readers are familiar with it, um, if not, you're going to have to explain any kind of terms that they may not be familiar with. Even though your education may eventually speak to many consumers, you want your education to truly speak to the one person that's reading it. So to do this, we want to make sure um, that we're using personal pronouns and we're writing in a conversational style. So rather than saying um, he did this or she should do this, use you or your as your appropriate pronouns, writing in an active voice rather than a passive voice. We want the, our readers who are reviewing the materials to be able to frame the concepts in, in their own life and take what they're reading, you know, back home to, to put it into action. An active voice makes it really clear who is supposed to do what. Um, so in an active sentence, the person is the subject. I also believe that when we write in, a, when in an active voice, it speaks directly to our consumer. The education seems more relevant and they're able to really reflect on it more. And then finally, think about your wording. Um, well, some techniques will vary from language to language, um, but we wanna make sure again that we're using simple word choices when at all possible. Next, look at the design, consider your design. The visual appearance of communication is just as important as the structure in the language. You may want your materials um, to really engage your audience and draw them in and, what, and that can be accomplished through your design. It's the kind of that whole concept that we eat with our eyes first. If our meal looks more visually appealing, we're more likely to eat it. The same goes with consumer facing content. The more visually appealing, the increased likelihood of our consumers actually reviewing it. So when developing your content, consider the design and the overall visual appeal of your resource. You're gonna consider uh, first your layout. Text design makes it easy to skim and scan content. We want to make sure that the layout and the margins include plenty of white space that helps to separate different parts of the text. It also helps to guide the eye and then also make sure that the page isn't so busy that it's difficult to read. We already addressed kind of the structure and the organization of the piece, but keep in mind your headers and your subtitles will help your readers navigate the material. So make sure those pieces are meaningful and they're actually navigating your reader around your resource. I pulled this example uh, from the CDC Simply Put Guide. So while it's a little bit difficult to actually read on the screen, the concept here is really all about white space. Uh, both documents present similar content. However, the document on the left is easier to read because there's more white space. Um, too much content, again, can, can be very overwhelming um, so if you have a lot of content, look for opportunities to adjust your layout, include more white space. Um, but if it's too much, perhaps consider breaking it up into multiple handouts, multiple resources. Next, look at your font and your type, type, um, type size. We want to make sure that the fonts and the type size are easy to read. There should be plenty of contrast between the text and the background. And then spacing between lines and paragraphs um, is at least the same throughout the entire um, handouts and it's also the same as the size of the font that you're using. 
And then finally, look at your graphics. Consider using visual um, devices such as tablets, photos, charts um, to present your information. This can help also keep your readers engaged. But keep in mind, visuals should be used to only enhance your message. It's kind of that whole concept of repeating key points. So don't use your visuals to teach new content, but rather use them as a way um, to kind of re, re, uh, review, repeat um, your, your content just through a different kind of format. <clears throat> and then finally, you want to ensure that your materials, that your resources are culturally sensitive. Culture really affects how people understand and respond to health messages. The best way to ensure your materials are culturally appropriate is to engage members of that target audience early on um, when you're kind of planning out your resource and learn who they are. Talk to them, but most, more importantly, listen. Uh, your audience will help you identify messages and images that likely work best within their culture and your education materials should unique, uniquely reflect the needs and the values of the groups that you're serving, which also includes their culture. Um, a few considerations to really keep in mind. Um, use preferred and respectful terms uh, when you refer to even the group or condition and focus on the person. Um, so as an example, you would say a person or a consumer with diabetes instead of saying the diabetic. Be really careful, careful about the language of some words that you use as they can have different meanings um, in different cultures. For example, the word dementia can actually indicate uh, insanity in some cultures. So if you use the word dementia, make sure you define it. Make sure your audience has a clear understanding of what you mean by that word. And consider the use of complementary uh, medicines, alternative medicine practices, dietary practices. These can all vary by different cultures. Um, so consider that as you prepare your materials. And then also really consider um, the need of translation. Um, do, do, do your content, um, does your content, do your resources need to be translated for your audience? You may even consider getting advice from a community organization uh, that perhaps is very familiar with the culture and they can provide um, kind of a, a good level of understanding about the unique needs of that target audience and how best to communicate with them. And then finally, you'll want to evaluate and maybe even find opportunity to improve your consumer facing content. Um, so if you're developing new content, it's always a great idea to evaluate your content. Obviously, we want to make sure that uh, your consumers can find what they need, understand what they find, and then they're using that information um, to meet their needs or to apply it to their life. If you have existing nutrition education content, this is really important to see if there's any revisions or changes that need to be made to your content um, that, can, that can really improve your message or improve your consumer's understanding. So there's really two goals of this evaluation. One goal is to really determine whether or not the nutrition education has been successfully delivered um, to your consumers, to your target audience. The second goal is to learn if those people who have participated, who have received your nutrition education, have benefited in any way. Um, hopefully they have, and that will lead them to practicing healthier eating behaviors. Um, but we wanna make sure that they're kind of taking something away from, from the resources that you have developed. <clears throat> Obviously keep in mind, um, even though you may deliver the same education to multiple people, Individual experiences um, will affect outcomes. So we know some of our consumers may retain more information than others. Also, there's that frequency of exposures. If we have one uh, consumer that's receiving more uh, nutrition education than another, it's very common and um, we should anticipate that um, the, they, may, they may benefit in um, a different way um, because they've received more education frequently than another person. 
So when you look at evaluating your content, at the very simple level, you could even use kind of a standard or a checklist or ask someone to review your nutrition education content and give you feedback. Um, if it's possible, I do recommend that you kind of uh, do a test drive with your, with your audience, with your consumers. You could do this through survey, um, through feedback. If you're delivering a new education material, maybe do a survey at the end to kind of get some feedback. Um, you could do pre-test, post-test to really assess what information um, they took away or they retained. So that's one method you can do. There's a lot of uh, checklists that are available on their internet that you may be able to use to evaluate your developed content. Both of those resources I shared with you today, uh, so Maine Health Guidelines and CDC Simply Put, both of those include checklists to evaluate your consumer-facing materials. They also both have formulas uh, to determine and calculate your readability level. Um, if you have uh, software accessible, many software solutions, even Microsoft Word, um, we'll do a very base ca basic calculation of readability level. Again, if you don't know the uh, literacy level of your consumers, aim for a sixth to eighth grade reading level. Um, that usually will meet uh, most people's uh, literacy um, levels that you would um, you would usually encounter. Um, and then finally, if there's uh, an opportunity to to ask for consumer feedback or even a survey your consumers to see what education is important to them to improve existing content, um, that's always recommended. And then earlier I mentioned uh, that the evidence really supports this teach back method as being a very powerful solution to improve our consumers comprehension of our education. So in, in the event you have an opportunity to encourage and implement teach back method, strive to do that. I know that this isn't feasible in all settings, nor is it um, a great option for perhaps home delivered meal providers, um, but within like a congregate nutrition setting, it can be a really great opportunity to enhance learning, foster relationships, and then increase socialization. Um, it's also a really wonderful evaluation tool to determine if your education you're delivering is, is meeting the mark. So you would ask your consumers, uh, your audience, to explain your instructions, kind of teach me what you've learned. Um, if you've gone over any action, perhaps, let's say we were educating about proper food temperatures, ask them to demonstrate or, or kind of walk you through those procedures. You want to ask questions that begin with how and what and really try not to use closed ended questions. And that's going to be a really great way for you to see if they're retaining, if they understand the information that you've presented. And then finally, here's uh, a few resources that are easily accessible on the Internet. Um, some of the resources I referred to during my discussion today. Um, but there's many others on here that you may want to explore a little bit further. So next we're going to jump into some commonly asked questions and hopeful, I'm hopeful I can provide uh, some answers uh, to some of these questions that you may have. So the first question is, what have you seen as being the biggest challenge for nutrition providers in identifying or providing nutrition education? So within the past year, the biggest challenge has absolutely been the ability to continue providing effective nutrition education um, despite the pandemic. So in Ohio, and I would guess in many places nationwide, uh, our congregate meal sites have closed. Our senior centers have closed. Our adult day um, provider locations have also closed. And this has had a huge impact on service delivery in, in those areas uh, that include nutrition, nutrition education, and in a lot of other services. Um, we also saw a lot of closures of some other uh, community locations, such as our libraries that often hosted uh, nutrition education events 
or even some of our evidence-based programs. Um, and a lot of our, our area agencies on aging and nutrition service providers have really had to pivot and find other avenues to meet nutrition education needs of consumers. Uh, for many, this included exploring virtual options, um, maybe even virtual congregate meals, <clears throat> and the ability to, del to deliver nutrition education over the phone or even through web-based meeting platforms. Um, many of our partners took to social media outlets, so promoting uh, sound nutrition practices through Facebook, Instagram, or even blog posts on their website. I think another struggle is really uh, the challenge with, con with um, continuing to identify needs of our, of our home delivered meal consumers. Um, so we saw an increase in the amount of consumers requiring home delivered meals during the pandemic. Um, and, and these are often our most at risk consumers, um, but they may also benefit the most from really great nutrition education. The tricky part here is really adapting to meet their unique needs. And this audience is often uh, challenging to determine what their nutrition needs are beyond just providing the meal. Um, it, it can be more individualized. It can be harder to assess um, to really identify what those needs are. And then finally, while I've really only been in the AG network for the past couple years, I've noticed that we and our partners seem to fall into this, um, to this way of this is how we've always done things. And I notice a hurdle and sometimes a struggle is truly to acknowledge and appreciate the benefit of nutrition education. We need to think of it not only as simply checking the box as a requirement, but really as a strategy to prevent poor health outcomes. And then an opportunity to further enhance the health and wellness of our older adults. This means that we need to ensure our nutrition education uh, we offer is attractive, visually appearing, appealing, it's up to date, it resounds well, and we need to make sure that our participants, our consumers are not receiving the same education each time. We want to keep it fresh, keep it inviting, um, making sure that we're oper offering opportunity for them to enhance what they already know. So the next question is, what are the resources you should use to develop nutrition education and how do you kind of find or you decide on those topics? How do I develop nutrition education that's tailored to my consumers? So this is a great question. Um, we touched on this a lot today and it really goes back to learning about your audience. If you have the opportunity to talk with your consumers and you really learn about their needs and what information they need, uh, to stay well, that's that's a perfect uh, way to go. So going back to points I discussed about identifying your audience, um, this will really help to ensure you develop nutrition education that's tailored to their needs. One of the best approaches you may consider is actual post testing. So you develop the resource, uh, you know, whatever it may be, and then you provide it to a sample of your consumers and then evaluate their response. Do the nutrition education resound well with them? Did it meet their need? Do they have even more questions after it's been delivered to them? Um, that can really help to shape and influence um, the nutrition education that you develop. And then the final question is related to how we will support our area agencies on aging and our network of service providers with this um, change and modification in the nutrition education definition. So as a state agency, we are really seeking opportunities to better support our AAAs, our nutrition service providers, and then our aging partners to enhance our nutrition education. Um, we're looking to develop more statewide resources that any of these partners can use in the field um, to ensure one, that these resources meet health literacy needs, and then they achieve that overall goal for really um, providing and enhancing sound nutritional knowledge for older adults. Um, many of our partners already have great resources and education tools that resound well with our consumers. Um, and we really believe that to be a, a great opportunity to share more resource, resources statewide. So, you know, no need to reinvent the wheel, but um, looking for opportunities to increase collaborations and uh, find more ways to share these resources with all of our partners we think would be a great benefit. And then, you know, really focusing on nutrition education and counseling. 
Um, you know, it should be a very important component of caring for the older adults. It can be both preventative and then, you know, maintaining any kind of chronic conditions. So we're always looking for ways to increase outreach of those services and promote those services within our populations. Thanks, Carmen. In addition to the terrific resources Carmen has shared, I want to let you know about some federal resources and highlight some innovation and nutrition grantee nutrition education efforts. The ACL National Resource Center on Nutrition and Aging is a must-see website. It was just created in 2021, so it will continue to grow and have additional functionality. You'll want to check out all the latest guidance and technical assistance regarding COVID-19, including many great resources on nutrition education and consumer-facing materials. The Food and Nutrition Information Center, also called FINIC, was established to serve the professional community, including educators, health professionals, policymakers, and researchers. FINIC provides access to a wide range of trustworthy food and nutrition resources for both government and non-government sources. FINIC is part of the USDA National Agricultural Library, and it serves as a true library of information on food and nutrition topics. You can view the top-level top topics on the FINIC website on the sidebar menu on the left side of the page. As you can see, there are many topics. However, ones that you might be interested in are the dietary guidance, life, life cycle nutrition, diet and health, surveys, reports and research, professional and career resources, and food labeling. Nutrition.gov offers credible Nutrition.gov offers credible information to help the public make healthful eating choices. All information is based on the dietary guidelines for Americans. Resources are sourced mostly from federal agencies and federally funded organizations like Cooperative Extension. You can see a variety of topics offered on Nutrition.gov in the drop-down menu on the screenshot on this slide. Finally, I want to draw your attention to the Espanol toggle on the top right corner of the home page screenshot. The Spanish toggle is available on all pages and can be clicked to refresh the page for resources in Spanish. An innovation in nutrition grantee, New York's Public Health Solution, launched a six-week nutrition curriculum. An ACL Innovation in Nutrition grantee, Public Health Solutions, just launched a six-week nutrition curriculum for older adults in East Harlem in collaboration with registered dietitians and Columbia University's Institute for Human Nutrition Food Co-op. The program is held both in English and in Spanish. It covers an introduction to the East Harlem food environment and culture, health outcomes, and food justice, in addition to nutrition topics around my plate, the DASH diet, and skill building for seniors. During the pandemic, classes have been held virtually. For senior participants with limited or no access to technology to the internet and tablets, along with unlimited data service, have been provided. That concludes this session. I hope everyone found this information helpful. Besides the resources we've already mentioned, we'd like to leave you with a few more. You can find other examples of what our innovation and nutrition grantees are doing on our website, and the link is provided on this slide. As mentioned, the National Resource Center on Nutrition and Aging has an excellent background on virtual nutrition education for older adults and links to so many resources and the SPR and OAPS links are provided. And lastly, ACL hosted a very popular webinar series in March of 2021 on the Senior Nutrition Program, the trifecta of nutrition, socialization, and health and well-being. The webpage has numerous examples of nutrition education and other activities you can implement virtually. And if you missed this series, I'd highly recommend you check it out. 
And of course, feel free to contact either Carmen or me if you have any questions. Our emails are listed in this slide. Thank you.